TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom, good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem and in today's top stories. Tens of thousands of Israelis flood the streets of Jerusalem in support of the government's aspiration to pass a judicial reform. The Israeli Navy and U.S. Fifth Fleet hold a joint maneuver near the strategic strait of Bab el-Mandab amid rising maritime tensions versus Iran. Pentagon Press Secretary Brigadier General Pat Ryder highlights that the United States is not interested in war with Russia amid rising tensions in Syria. Following a month-long recess, Israel's parliament, or Knesset in Hebrew, is set to open its summer session with the collection of sensitive bills and policy decisions. During the three months ahead, coalition lawmakers will attain a window of opportunity to pass legislation which relates to overhauling the judiciary as part of the Israeli coalition's proclaimed intention to reassert a long-lost balance between the three branches of government. And while negotiation teams for both the coalition and opposition, under the auspices of President Yitzhak Herzog, are proactively engaged in talks to reach a viable compromise agreement on the judicial reform, representatives of the president's residence have clarified to both negotiating teams the talks between the sides will not be allowed to continue endlessly. Moreover, they stress that if the sides fail to reach agreements within a reasonable period of time, an expiration date for the talks would be set. Meanwhile, senior officials of the ruling Likud party have voiced concern over a growing perception in which Prime Minister Bimi Netanyahu is trying to stall for time rather than push the judicial reform through legislation. Consequently, Justice Minister Yeriv Levin recently launched a campaign in which he sought to press Prime Minister Netanyahu not to delay the reform or even pull back from it altogether. This pressure campaign peaked last night when Minister Levine, in cooperation with Finance Minister Bitsalis Smotrich, among others, called for a mass demonstration in Jerusalem, relabeling it as a million strong demonstration. And while the demonstration fell far short of its label, the streets adjacent to Israel's parliament and ministerial offices attracted a multitude of predominantly conservative supporters of the reform which were subsequently estimated between 150 and 200,000 people. I tell my friend Justice Minister, come and see the public now. I also say to the Prime Minister of us all, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and I say to all of my friends who are sitting here, look at how much power we have. They, the progressive camp, have the media, and they have tycoons who fund the protests but we have the nation. Well, seemingly encouraged by the masses that gathered in Jerusalem from all corners of the country, Justice Minister Levine evidently took note of the inadequate turnout and therefore highlighted the figure of those who voted for Israel's incumbent coalition, which effectively grants the government a comfortable majority to retain Jerusalem's reins of power. More than two million Israelis went out about six months ago and voted in the true referendum. The elections. They voted in favor of judicial reform. It is important to highlight that Justice Minister Levine remains vocally committed to changing the makeup of the Judges Selection Committee in particular and plans to hold up appointments to the Supreme Court, including appointing a court president in the event in which negotiations at the president's residence fails to yield results within the next three months. One of the key reasons for his resolute urgency includes the fact that incumbent Supreme Court President Estel Chayut, who is regarded to be a so-called progressive-leaning judge, is due to retire in about six months' time. Nevertheless, regardless of any merit related to balancing the makeup of Jerusalem's tenured Supreme Court judges, Mounting pressure that emanates from Washington, international credit rating agencies and other governments and institutions may prove that implementing a reform to the judiciary without broader political consensus would undoubtedly come at a heavy cost to Israel's international standing and perceived economic stability.
Turning to the West Bank districts of Judea and Samaria, where IDF, ISA, or Shin Bet, and Border Police Special Operations Forces conducted counter-terror activity as part of Operation Wavesbreaker, during the course of which two suspected terror operatives were apprehended. According to the IDF spokesperson's unit, during the course of the mission to apprehend one of the two suspects in the town of Jenin, Palestinian militants hurled explosive devices toward the Israeli forces, who responded with live fire. And while a hit was identified, no injuries were reported among the Israeli troops. Meanwhile, yesterday evening, IDF troops from the Nakha Reconnaissance Unit successfully thwarted a terror attack at the Gitaya Visal Junction in what was described as a nationalistically motivated ramming and stabbing attack. Earlier today, while the Nahal Reconnaissance Unit operated to protect motorways at Guido Vizar Junction, we identified a vehicle driving on the opposite lane deviating toward an adjacent bus stop and trying to run over pedestrians. Thereafter, disembarked from his car while holding a knife. I covered a police officer who approached the vehicle and when the terrorist attempted to stab the officer, another soldier and I opened fire toward the terrorist and neutralized him. It is important to know that no injuries were thankfully reported to any of the civilian pedestrians or troops at the scene. In other news, U.S. CENTCOM Commander General Michael Carilla concluded his one-day visit to Israel last night, prior to which he held, together with IDF Chief of General Staff Lieutenant General Hiltzi Alevi, a joint intelligence operational situation assessment and a discussion regarding cooperation between the militaries with members of the IDF General Staff and their American counterparts. Moreover, General Zalevi and Kurila also toured the Israeli Naval Commando Unit Shayet et Shlosre, where the latter received a debrief from the commander of the Israeli Commando Unit regarding Shayet et Shlosre's extensive operational activity in various arenas, including joint activity with their counterparts from the U.S. Navy SEALs. Upon conclusion, General Kurila proclaimed that the U.S. military-to-military -military relationship with Israel remains ironclad, while General Halevi for his part stressed, quote, We're actively following the changes in the region, with an emphasis on the increase in Iranian hostility and terror activity. Precisely in this sensitive time period, there is great importance in the close relationship between the IDF and the U.S. Armed Forces, we will continue the cooperation and the common commitment to the security in the Middle East. It is important to know that while the CENTCOM commander visited Israel, the Israeli Navy and U.S. 5th Fleet conducted a joint maneuver in the area of the Strait of Bab el Mandeb, a strategic waterway which borders on either side with both Yemen and Djibouti, respectively. Meanwhile, in Israel's northern neighbor, Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian met with Hezbollah Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah and Palestinian Islamic Jihad Secretary General Ziad al Nahala in Beirut earlier today, during which extensive discussions were held about preparatory work being implemented for the purpose of confronting Israel, after which the Islamic Republic's top diplomat toured the Lebanese border with the Jewish state. Moreover, during the course of his visit, Minister Amir Abdullahian also held meetings with the leadership of Beirut's transitional government. And while Tehran is known to hold sway over Beirut via its proxy Hezbollah, the Iranian foreign minister asserted the Ayatollah regime's support for holding presidential elections in Lebanon after many months in which the country remained without an acting head of state. It is interesting to know that while Tehran's top diplomat visited Lebanon today, Iran's top defense official, Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Ashtiani, traveled to India's New Delhi this morning as India's defense minister, Ranjath Singh, chaired a meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's defense ministers, including Russia, China, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, and Belarus, among others. This meeting comes at the heels of a separate meeting, which was hosted by Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu in Moscow on April 25th, together with the defense ministers and intelligence chiefs of Iran, Syria, and Turkey, as part of Russia's bid to mediate a normalization accord between Ankara and Damascus. And while limited information emerged out of this meeting, 
The top defense and intelligence officials from the four countries reportedly discussed provisions related to security guarantees, which Turkey demands, in return for its plausible withdrawal of troops from Syrian soil, a prerequisite which the Assad regime demands for normalization of relations with Ankara to become a viable reality. It is separately worth noting that this meeting also included messages which Turkey conveyed on behalf of the United States amid rising tensions between Russia and American forces in Syria. These tensions surfaced after a heavily armed Russian aircraft flew dangerously close to American infrastructure in Syria, in which the Pentagon warned could lead to dire consequences. We recognize that this type of activity by Russia uh, is very inappropriate. Uh, it also is very dangerous. Um, but we're not seeking to get into a conflict with Russia, nor are we looking to uh, divert attention from why it is that we're there. So we'll continue to use the deconfliction line. Uh, we'll continue to use both public and private means to communicate with the Russians on what is and is not appropriate. Thank you for watching TV7 Israel News. In light of TV7's broadcast schedule, TV7 Israel News will not air on Monday, but rather will resume broadcast on Tuesday, May 2nd. Separately, if you're blessed by our productions and would like to help support TV7 Israel's exclusively donation-based productions, please consider making a financial contribution. You can do so by visiting our website at www.tv7israelnews.com. As ever, I would like to also encourage you to unceasingly pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters worldwide, as well as for the peace of Jerusalem and salvation of Israel. I'm Jonathan Hassan. Until we meet again, God willing, wishing you a Shabbat Shalom and Mevorach.